Francis Xavier student, Kent Griffin of Merriweather, his score of 471 has made his day. Very surprised. It was uh, something I didn't expect. I, I was hoping, I was optimistic, but I certainly didn't expect 470. Next year I hope to go to Sydney to uh, Macquarie University where I'll be doing a Bachelor of Economics degree with actuarial majors and uh, then after I leave there I'll join an insurance company. Uh, I'll have a scholarship with one when I go to Macquarie and then I will complete four years after that and hopefully be a qualified actuary by the time I finish. 1985 was a controversial year for New South Wales HSC students with break-ins and widespread allegations of cheating. The Director of Education, Alan Beard, says that, to his knowledge, none of these problems affected the Hunter Valley students. We've done a little better than the average. Uh, if we take uh, the 50% mark, we can, I can say that more than 50% of our candidates did better than average in the HSC, and that's good news for all the schools in the Hunter region, I think. But meanwhile, the saga of the 1985 HSC continues, with many students confused and unsure about their marks and their future. Sometimes Theo van der Veen heads the Department of Education's Inquiry in Centre, which in conjunction with an advisory centre, helps students understand their marks and their entitlements. Sometimes the HSC is fairly difficult to interpret in terms of the information that's actually shown on the high school certificate. So we have three people, two of whom are school careers advisors and one is a school counsellor who in fact operate in the capacity of, of explaining to students exactly how they can use their high school certificate, uh, what universities they are eligible to, uh, to matriculate to, uh, what sorts of careers they can consider given the, the quality of the results for their high school certificate. suffering the first symptoms of having been poisoned by a blue-ringed octopus. Luckily, very little of the potentially deadly poison had entered his system. Uh, and by today, James was out of hospital and able to yeah, tell the unusual the story of yeah, how he was bitten. Um, he says he was diving for shells like a, when he uh, accidentally shell, picked up yeah. the octopus. And I, was up I was diving at uh, Shoal Bay down near Tomary Lodge and uh, I seen some seashells early in the morning that I'd would like to have brought home, you know, some nice colourful seashells. So uh, I went out, took my hand spear out and just wore my swimmers out. And um, I was diving in about three metres of water. And uh, I was diving down to get the seashells, coming back up for air and then just checking to make sure there's nothing in the seashells. Uh, unbeknownst to me, there must have been a blue ring right down in the spiral of one of the uh, seashells. And uh, I put about four or five of those shell shells and I was putting down the front of, me, front of me swimmers because I had a hand spear in one hand and a large abalone shell in, in the other hand. I felt something on the back of my right left buttock. And uh, so what I'd done is uh, I thought it was a bit of weed or some sand in there so I went back in the water to uh, just clear me swimmers and uh, the thing well, was still there, whatever it was, and I just brushed my left buttock and uh, brushed the thing out of me swimmers and uh, a blue ring just sort of floated out in front of me, you know. The experience of James Stevenson and the equally lucky recovery of 16-year-old Scott Miles from Albury, who was bitten at North Arm Cove on Port Stevens on Saturday, are reminders that people should be careful of the Blue Ringer. Children playing in rock pools are and particularly vulnerable and should be taught to leave Hello, the creatures Mato, alone. And I'll be However, on while it pays to be, be careful, careful, experience shows, shows the chances, chances of being bitten, bitten are extremely small. small. Despite, Despite the many, many thousands, thousands of blue rings living all around Australia's, Australia's coastline, coastline, the, the poison's, poison's information, information sentence says, says an average of only one person, person a year is bitten. bitten. Only, only a tiny, tiny handful of people, people have died. died. So, so it is very unusual for there to be two bitings on one weekend. Authorities stress there is no reason to panic about the blue ringed octopus. They say the chances of being bitten are extremely small. And as long as you leave the octopus alone, it will leave you alone. This is John Church reporting. 
For the last 10 years, Freeman's Waterhole has been the home of this World War I steam loco, but the weather and vandals have started to take their toll. So the Richmond Vale Railway Museum has decided to take things into their own hands and find this loco a brand new home. Join Ray Deneen and Anna Manzoni for all the news tonight at 6. scene of some holiday frolics today when 20 children were taught to play the clown. The workshop, led by clown around town Lindy Carruthers, aimed to teach the children the essentials of body movement, communication and social skills. Today's workshop will be followed by a class on a different subject each day until the 24th, including collage, puppet and mask making and kite making. The Community Arts Centre says children up to 14 years of age are welcome to attend as many of the workshops as they like. Meanwhile, if the kids are monkeying around, take them to Garden City, where the Sells Monkey Circus is the star attraction. Getting all the attention is Mr. Hugs, better known to most of us as Wally Walker, thanks to a well-known television commercial. This multi-talented superstar agreed to come out of retirement due to popular demand and will be strutting his stuff each day this week and next. There are many variables in the school wear market. Prices vary with the sizes and the quality of the uniforms, as well as the school's requirements. Regional Director of Education, Alan Beard, the says the department doesn't years. have any hard and fast rules about uniforms. He says it will support to parents and principals who are in favour of the unity that uniforms can bring to the school. According to Mr Beard, certain attire is required for physical education and industrial arts, but that's mainly for safety reasons. But back to the uniforms. Tunics can cost anywhere from $22 to $30. Blouses upward from $9 and socks start at about $2.50. With primary school age boys, shirts and shorts start at about $8. Oh, 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 oh. The number required depends on how rough the children are on their clothes or how quickly they grow. And then of course there's the shoes, which have been a point of contention in many schools. The problem is over whether students should wear sandals, running shoes or leather shoes. Often the cost and peer group pressure determines which is chosen. The prices range from about $12 to $35, from the sandals to the fully covered leather shoes. Stationery can also set you back a pretty penny, with the average student paying up to $60 for exercise books, textures, pencils, loose leaf paper and textbooks. For those who are finding it hard to make ends meet, most of the larger schools have clothing pools with well-kept second-hand uniforms. There are a few jockeys with records as impressive as Robert Thompson's. The 27-year-old from Cessnock had his first ride at 14 years of age. The next year he rode his first winner. He's won five consecutive apprentices premierships and has chalked up six jockeys premierships since. In the season that finished on July the 31st, Thompson rode 159 winners, more than any other jockey in Australia. Leading Sydney trainer Neville Begg is one that recognises his talents. He believes Thompson would hold his own with any jockey in the world. Robert Thompson, world-class jockey. Keeping up with the Joneses has been a time-honoured tradition, but keeping up with Redhead's beach flag specialist Michael Jones has been almost impossible for Australia's best for a number of years now. Mick Jones has now won four national beach flag titles, the last three in a row. He's also won a world title in Bali and a third place in Hawaii. On the local scene, he's unbeatable and holds titles on all competitive levels, including club, branch and state honours, through to the national title he won this year at Port Leo in Victoria. But he's not totally happy with that. The flags are his, but he wants a beach sprint gold medal to go with it. Mick Jones, multinational beach flags champion. Barefoot water skier Debbie Pugh has not only tasted the sweetness of success, but the bitterness of frustration in losing when world gold was in her grasp. 
She's not deterred though and will be there with the Australian team in West Germany for the next World Championship. January saw Debbie in the ACT to take their state title with a world record score in tricks. She backed this up later in the year when she won New South Wales titles, set three Australian and world records and became the first to break 2,000 points in tricks worldwide. Debbie Pugh, barefoot world record holder. Glenn Ritchie will become a household name. He's an athlete with an enormous future and a recent past chock full of outstanding results. He started the year with wins in the 800 and 1600 metre Australian Professional Championships and the National 15 kilometre Pro title in Australian course record time. He soon backed that up with state wins in the 800 metres, 1600 metres, 5 kilometres and 10 kilometres which he created new state and national records. He also won the 15 kilometre event. Throw in another 10 wins in top company and it's no wonder this man has been voted the top pro athlete in this country. Glenn Ritchie, future international athletics star. A small group of hospital board members and close friends gathered for dinner last night at the Madison Motor Inn at Charlestown to honour 70-year-old Peter Bradley. Mr Bradley is retiring as he has to after more than 25 years as a board member of the hospital. He was elected to the board in 1960 when members were elected by the public. He served as board chairman for six years and had the Bradley Ward in the new wing named after him. He retires as the longest serving board member and has seen the hospital come from being more or less a little country hospital to a major teaching hospital with over 200 beds. In the recent past, the best the Newcastle team has been able to manage in the state interbranch championships is third spot. The championships have been dominated by the strong Sydney club Manly Warringah, which boasts big names like Craig Riddington. Late yesterday afternoon, the 15-man local team battled strong winds and rough seas at Blacksmiths Beach to put in some final preparation for this year's event. This Sunday, the annual event will be held at Blacksmiths Beach, and aside from any home advantage, Coach Greg Kelly says his team has the depth and strength to stop Sydney's winning streak. Our chances this weekend are excellent. I believe this is one of the best interbranch teams that from Newcastle has picked for many years and I believe we're really going to uh, give the Sydney and Manly Winger branches a run for their money. In the past we've really been a little in the shadow of the Sydney clubs, we're sort of the country club. I think we'll change that image this year. Very much so. I think it's already started with uh, performances uh, by John Anderson last weekend in the State Bank uh, Classic where he uh, beat Craig Grinnington and Darren Mercer who are considered two of the top Ironmen in the country. Plus we've got uh, top junior competitors in Nick Tonana and Paul Tonks who are Australian champions and Michael Jones who's also a World uh, Flags champion so we'll be right in there. This is all that remains of the house on the entrance road at Foresters Beach. Police say the fire started in the lounge room at about 3.30 this morning. Fire brigades from the entrance in Kalani Vale attended the blaze. According to police, 24-year-old Owen Howard was in the lounge room when the fire started. His wife, awakened by the fire, opened the lounge room door to find the room engulfed in flames. She grabbed her four and two-year-old sons and ran next door to alert the fire brigade. Mr Howitt managed to fight his way out of the house but received burns to 40% of his body. Police are investigating the cause of the fire. This was the Iron Newcastle's first visit to its namesake port. As she left the harbour today, 
the new bulk carrier had 137,971 tonnes of coal aboard, establishing a new port record. The coal is bound for two ports in Japan. Aboard the Iron Newcastle is BHP Chairman Sir James Balderstone, who will stay on the ship for a few days before flying off by helicopter near Gladstone. BHP has two other bulk carriers now under construction, one in Japan and one in Korea. They'll replace the Iron Duke, which has been sold for scrap, and the Iron Sirius, which will leave the fleet in June. Also in the harbour at the moment is another ship making her first visit here. The Pacific Grace, a sister ship to the Hunter River, is under charter to load aluminium for Japan from the Alcan smelter at Curry Curry. These two ships are small, but will make frequent trips about every three weeks. The Pacific Grace is loading 5,900 tonnes of aluminium and should leave for Japan on Monday. The use of small ships lowers the need for stockpiling, but puts demands on Alcan to meet the shipping deadline. Good afternoon, I'm Janelle Provost. Voters in three New South Wales electorates face the polls today. Three ALP members have resigned over the past three months, leaving vacancies in Kiama, Cabramatta and Canterbury. Premier Rann and Opposition Leader Griner are both on the campaign trail today to raise support for their respective candidates. Americans today mourned the seven astronauts killed in the Space Shuttle Challenger explosion earlier this week. The largest memorial service was held at the Kennedy Space Centre in Houston. Thousands of mourners, family, friends or workmates were there to farewell those who died in a tragedy that has touched the heart of America. President Reagan and his wife Nancy comforted the distressed families, but the President also gave an assurance that as a tribute to those who lost their lives, America would press on with its space program. Man will continue his conquest of space to reach out for new goals and ever greater achievements. That is the way we shall commemorate our seven Challenger heroes. Meanwhile, the search continued for pieces of wreckage off the coast of Florida that may give some clue as to why the Challenger exploded. Divers say they have spotted a large metal object on the ocean floor that may be the module that the seven astronauts were in. $10,000 worth of finches have been stolen from a backyard aviary in Wall's End. The owner says he awoke to find a hole cut in the aviary and 151 pairs of valuable finches were gone. Wall's End police are calling on the public for any information on the theft. And now to the weather. A warm, humid, partly cloudy day with winds from the north to northeast at 10 to 20 knots. Seas are slight on a low to moderate swell. We'll have details on these and more stories tonight on NBN News at 6. The mood at Carrington Slipways today was one of sunny confidence as the latest ferry, the Scarborough, waited for launch. The company has completed 10 of the innovative twin hull designs on time and at the right price. The $2 million ferry is one of four being built with federal government bicentennial funds. The 11th and last of the series, the Friendship, will be launched later this year. On hand for the Scarborough launching was the Federal Transport Minister Peter Morris, the State Transport Minister Barry Unsworth and Youth and Community Services Minister Frank Walker. It was Mr Walker's wife Marilyn who did the honours, cracking champagne over the Scarborough's bow and sending her on her way. The ferry will soon be plying Sydney Harbour, where she will carry up to 400 passengers at a top speed of 14 knots.
Following media reports about the attack on the 76-year-old Merriweather woman, police have been informed of a similar incident that happened at Wall's End in the early hours of Saturday morning. There, an elderly woman awoke to find a strange man in her house. He was wearing only underpants and was brandishing a knife. She screamed, she raised the alarm and he fled before harming her. Police are now investigating links between these two incidents and also the rape late last year of a 72-year-old woman in Beaumont Street, Hamilton. They've appealed to the public for assistance in their investigations and have released this description of a man they're seeking. He's aged 30 to 40 and is 172 centimetres or about 5 foot 6 inches tall. Of solid to fat build, he has short dark hair. It's possible he has an accent or speaks in broken English. Anyone having seen anything strange in the Merriweather or Walls End areas over the weekend or knowing anyone fitting this description is asked to contact their local police as soon as possible.